Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Melvin Way and this is a plant growing series on growing California poppies from seeds. It's day zero. I'm scooping in some cocoa choir which is made from uh, ripped up coconut husks. I believe this came from India. So definitely salt could be a little bit of a concern although I haven't had a problem. I didn't sterilize this like I did in first few series using cocoa choir such as in 2022 with um, oven baking for 90 to 120 minutes at a slightly above boiling temperature of water because uh, I was in a hurry uh, otherwise I would have done so uh, the risk is low of having parasite eggs and other pests in there um, it's very very low compared to using store-bought potting mix which is just uh, riddled with pests so this is the seed packet that i chose i bought this off amazon so the top paragraph there if you want to pause it, it says um, they like to develop tap roots which is uh, true i found to be later and um, they don't like to be disturbed so i'll show you that later so i had many attempts of growing this uh, back in 2022 you can see the seeds are kind of a moldy green uh, they weren't always like that uh, going back a year ago when i first started using this packet and no matter what packets you buy you're going to have uh, at least like a thousand seeds uh, up to ten thousand etc some people sell bags of like a hundred thousand seeds so uh, to create your own super bloom you're going to need a lot of seeds but at the same time uh, you can see i'm sowing way too many in here and the reason is uh, because they look sort of green and moldy. I didn't know if uh, there was going to be a very high germination success rate. So uh, I'll show you in a few minutes uh, what happened. So uh, just to be safe, I wanted to sow hundreds and hundreds of seeds in case the germination rate was very low. Because uh, if I'm going to try to transplant these, which the packet does say not to do, then... Um, I, I want way more than just 1% uh, of uh, these to survive uh, to Germany. So the reason I'm doing it this way, and uh, I'll show you, I'm going to bring this indoors and then just uh, get it wet and just uh, let it sit indoors uh, day in and day out is because uh, the overnight temperatures indoors are much more even. So the nighttime temperatures are much higher and that helps um, keep things um, I mean that helps boost the germination uh, speed tremendously uh, at least that's what I found in the past so um, yeah I'm just adding the finishing touches you can see this uh, cocoa choir is a very porous very loosely packed material so unless you really pat it down it's just gonna be very well aerated and fluffy which is a great advantage for root breathability, uh, roots need oxygen to breathe. But um, at the same time, it is kind of a detriment if you think about it for uh, plants anchoring themselves in there. But for the sake of germinating a lot of seeds in very gentle windless conditions indoors that you're going to transplant anyway after the first few days, within the first few days of germination, uh, this is basically the perfect material all right so let's just add up the finishing touches all right so on day six germination was achieved and shocking how many germinated i didn't expect that um, because the seeds look all green and moldy i also tried germinating some rainy cherry and white nectarine pits i had been stratifying um somewhat intentionally but also uh, i just kind of forgot about them or didn't get around to having um, the time and uh, energy to start series on those until uh, i moved um, so that was the last apartment i just kept those pits and i moved them over when i moved into this um, townhouse and uh, i didn't get around to try germinating those until now so um getting back to this series um, these look sort of like bean sprouts, very miniature bean sprouts. Um, they're obviously a lot smaller. They look a lot more frail. You can see these uh, cotyledons, the starter leaves coming out. So um, 
it all looks pretty good. Uh, we've got several hundred here. Um, not the outcome I was expecting. Um, it seems like the coloration of the seeds uh, after a year doesn't even matter. And I would say that, uh, yeah, the success rate was is nearly like 100% here. Um, not what I was expecting because I think on the seed packet itself, it says uh, that they expire after a year generally. So I'm um, very surprised there. And uh, on day seven, you can see there's been a lot of growth. Um, during the day, I don't have any lights on. I just crack the blinds open a little bit and get a little bit of oblique um, angle, like uh, sun coming in. It's very, very, it's not direct sunlight. So, or maybe not direct for like most of the hours of the day, probably only for just a few minutes. So uh, these don't really have that much in the way of resources. And Cocoa Choir has um, no nutritional value in it um, in terms of like uh, there, there's just no micronutrients, um, macronutrients in there really for the seedlings to extract from. So they're just living off of the moisture within. You can see the top is already drying out a little bit and they're also uh, relying on what's stored in their seeds. So it's day eight. Um, there's been quite a bit of growth. And as you can see, they're getting very long. And like with all plants uh, that are grown in these kind of artificial conditions, uh, depending on what you give them, they tend to be long and spindly and fall over and be unable to support themselves, which is nothing like you what you'd see in the wild. Although I've never observed California poppy germinating in the wild. So uh, in the places that you get California poppies uh, in super blooms, if you don't go there during a super bloom, you basically see nothing. And if it's an off year, you see pretty much nothing. Um, it's almost like the plant went extinct. So I went to Lake Elsinore in 2020 spring uh, um, or late winter, you know, the year after the super bloom of 2019, and I didn't see anything. It was almost like the plant 99.99% uh, .99 went extinct. You could see some very small blooms, um, but uh, yeah, I tried to look around for the foliage of um, the regular plants um, and I didn't see anything. So uh, these are getting long and spindly and they're sort of all falling together. But because there's so many of them and they're still young, they're sort of like forming this dense mat of hair essentially. But uh, there's, I'm not so sure this is even a phototropism, although there may be a little bit. It's just due to gravity, everything's kind of falling over. It's getting too long. They're looking for a place with sunlight, essentially. And I'm going to have to take these outside soon. And some of them have trouble um, shedding their seed coats, it seems. Although it's the, you know, it's just a tiny, tiny minority. I mean, you can count the number. Uh, maybe it's, uh, you know, 15, 20, something like that of several hundred. So that's not bad at all. And um, yeah, I'm going to have to take these outside soon. Um, they're not as fat as bean sprouts, soybean sprouts. So this is a very good start, but I'm kind of worried about what it said on the seed packet, which is um, they don't handle transplants well. And I've read that on online sources too so I'm, I'm not too enthused about the prospect of trying to transplant these at such high density you can imagine so this is on day nine uh, that's how much sunlight gets in here and it's been a very cloudy um, 2023 so there's been virtually zero direct sunlight so I'm keeping then these in here for a few more days it's day 10 just to um, see how they develop and it's really nice having plants indoors. Uh, you could just like look at them every day without having to go outside. Um, so yeah, they're getting long. Uh, they're not very dark green at all. There's a, a lack of light uh, and I don't want to waste electricity having them 
underneath uh, fluorescent lights all day. Um, I think I still have my red and blue LED light panel somewhere in a closet, uh, but I haven't broken that out yet. But the reason I haven't used that is because I, I just don't have um, like a good place to set these things up for that, and I don't want them to uh, get acclimated to um, you know that red and blue light. Instead, I'll just take them outside and provide them with more natural conditions. So it's day 13. I had the time. It was finally sunny. And uh, it's said that California poppies do not suffer transplants well. So we're, we're going to find that out firsthand. But just looking at the density, it's like, how would you even approach this? Uh, you put on your gloves or whatever, and you try to uh, finesse your fingertips into the cocoa choir. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to hear some ripping noises and whatnot. And um, yeah, it's going to be uh, in, unpleasant in that aspect. Uh, I can already tell trying to separate these. It's like a tangled mat of hair. It's going to be a nightmare. There's going to be ripping noises. I'm going to feel like rips. And uh, I bet a lot of these won't survive the transplanting process. But the thought process here was that if I have uh, dozens per tuft that I transplant, then at least one has to survive, right? But as you can see, I'm already getting a really bad feeling from this. Um, you know, they have no structure. Some of them already are experiencing sort of a damping off um, right after the transplant, um, you know, or they're, they're just broken stems or pinched. Uh, stems, I guess, pinched bean sprouts, essentially. And they're all just falling over. Um, it's not looking good. And this is like immediately after the transplant in mild sun. So uh, I'm not getting a good feeling about this. I don't think any of these will survive. Uh, maybe 1% will. And that's what I was counting on. And um, yeah, it's just, um, I don't have a good premonition about this. So it's, uh, it was worth a shot. I was having trouble germinating these outdoors in this little strip of, uh, I wouldn't even call it land. Um, I think it's probably just uh, de heavily decomposed potting mix and things like that. Uh, maybe a little bit of mulch from uh, years bygone. And this is the tall pot of cocoa choir that I was using to grow my papaya tree, which rotted away. So that's uh, my previously uh, the, my previous video. And that I think was due to just the excessive amount of rain in 2023. And I was also watering with my garden hose and um, I wasn't providing enough nutrients. So I think that was a case of root rot and also just way too much water washing away all their nutrients and causing rot. So, um, yeah, like, uh, I, I think I experienced that with my lemon tree as well during the summer of 2023, basically a few weeks ago and, uh, lost a lot of leaves. Um, there were some caterpillars, uh, bird poop caterpillars preying on it again. And basically, um, yeah, the foliage was all starting to die and fall off. It was, uh, you could tell the plant was unhealthy. And I think that was just because I had flushed all the nutrients out repeatedly and the rain did. And uh, I hadn't fertilized for quite a while for most of my plants. So it's uh, definitely like a, a testament to how cocoa choir may be very poor at uh, holding nutrients. So the moment you stop fertilizing, or if you don't have any organic material mixed in there, then your plants become unhealthy and start losing all their leaves and rotting. So um, yeah, this is cocoa choir. It's not dirt. That's what it looks like being sprinkled away. And you can see it's a total mess. Um, I'm trying to save these little uh, transplanted seedlings, tufts of uh, transplants that I don't think will will make it but it's definitely worth a try just to see what happens and i think this kind of information is uh, valuable for people who want to try growing california poppies for themselves uh, you definitely want to see like uh, what happens in all these different 
types of growing scenarios, um, an experiment, a comprehensive experiment with many variables and tests is much more valuable to the viewer than just uh, showing you the finished product and saying, see, this is how uh, great I am at growing XYZ plant. So uh, definitely the failures are important to watch as well, although it's not nearly as exciting, it doesn't generate um, all that hype. But as you can see, this um, huge mat of California poppy seedlings from the original pot that I had indoors, um, it's doing fine for the time being. But we'll see as the days go by how this thing fares. Um, there's the whole aspect of um, the shock of bringing these outside into, and this isn't even harsh sun because it's been a, a cold, cloudy year. But as you can see, uh, so many seedlings have died here that um, I know the coca choir has some fibers uh, that have the sort of the same appearance, but um, a lot of these like fibers you see on top are just uh, dead California poppy seedlings and uh, their leaves. So there are a few that are uh, starting to germinate and standing upright still, or uh, I mar managed to bury them at the right angles to... Um, basically still be upright there's like webbings there i'm not sure if that's like spiders or spider mites uh, oftentimes you'll just see some gossamer threads of silk and uh, no spiders around so uh, this is what the pot looks like after a few days and um, it's not in good shape uh, you can see some more coming out that's always the case when you sow a lot of seeds. I've had that with many uh, plant growing series going back a decade, um, passion fruit, etc. You just have like uh, real, real late movers coming out, um, you know, even months after your uh, growing series begins. So uh, it's day 23. You can see uh, those ants, those are fine. Um, and you have uh, another seedling here. So this is how it develops. It has, uh, I guess, these two pairs of, uh, I don't know if you'd call these cotyledons, but um, after that, these two uh, two-pronged forks coming out, you have your true leaves. And this is what I'm talking about, the lack of uh, proper growing structure. You have stuff falling over in loose artificial mediums like this. So... Um, yeah, I mean, we're running into a lot of trouble. Uh, it's not a great start. And as you can see, so many of these things have died and it would just be like impossible to untangle all of that crap. So um, you can see there are some that look like they're growing upright, they're okay, they're buried at the right depth or they germinated uh, in good positions and orientations. And then you have this huge morass of crap um, that I'm just kind of keeping around for, um, you know, the prospect of backups, although the number of backups is rapidly dwindling. And I'm wondering if uh, germinating these indoors was even the right move. But if you consider the backdrop of what I just said uh, in the beginning, uh, over the course of 2022, I tried to sow these outside in that little strip of dirt on the left um, that I was showing you guys and gals um, you know a few minutes ago and basically nothing would ever germinate so um, it could be that it was just potty mix that was uh, heavily decomposed it's like toxic sludge uh, only certain species of weeds and very hardy plants suited to that can grow in it um, there's like plants for every niche uh, of environment but um, California poppies aren't on that list of things that can grow in that kind of uh, leftover garden sludge. So um, yeah, there's been a more development here and um, I think we're past the stage of uh, having pests being able to eat all of these. Although uh, you never know, there's a lot of snails and even some slugs around here. But as you can see, this is just like, uh, you know, it's just a tangled abomination. Uh, I don't even want to touch that for the time being, unless uh, I think there's uh, some value in doing so. Just kind of interesting to leave it.
like that. But um, as soon as I said that, well, I'm narrating way after the fact uh, that I filmed all of this. So I don't necessarily know what's coming up next uh, based off of memory of stuff I, I stitched together uh, from footage clips taken months ago. So um, yeah, I wanted to get this out uh, either for aesthetic reasons or just to see what's going on in there. And uh, I don't have high hopes. And as you can see, I have other uh, freshly germinated seedlings that were germinated outdoors um, that you can see sort of on the left of this pot. So uh, um, with regards to how we're facing it. So I thought, you know, there's no real need to uh, hold on to this maybe. And we can just do a post-mortem on this uh, tangled mess. So as you can see, the roots are very uh, shallow. And uh, maybe this is not the best way to develop these. Um, maybe natural sort of environment where, you know, it rains and then the sun beats down. So the top is all dry uh, of, the, of natural soil, which is composed of sand, silt, and clay then maybe if you have sun beating down on that, um, that means the plants are forced to grow roots, tap roots, uh, much, much deeper, much quicker to access the water beneath. So um, that's my thought process on, uh, well, that's just a small fraction of why uh, naturally grown roots in uh, real dirt are, unhealth, are way more healthy than what you see here. So with a lot of uh, balcony plants, uh, potted plants, um, what you'll see um, in potting mix, cocoa choir and whatever, is um, you have to keep watering to um, ensure that everything doesn't just dry out and die. But what that does is uh, it removes the need for the plants to uh, really develop their root system and uh, get the tap roots deep. And plus there's nowhere to go in your average pot. It's just, you go down a few uh, inches and a foot at best and uh, that's basically it. So um, yeah, this is a, a tangled mess. Uh, there's no real value in here. The roots don't really look healthy. I, I'm sure I broke a, a bunch of stuff and some of them look um, like there's been damping off or whatever, uh, fungi, bacteria, um, the usual suspects. So I took that out and I'm just going to leave the rest of the stuff alone. Uh, that seems to be developing well. Um, that stuff should at least have some potential going forward. Although, um, you know, we can't guarantee anything at this point just because, uh, I don't have experience in growing California poppy seeds. Well, I didn't prior to this. So, um, yeah, uh, it's just, uh, I did that also to show you the root systems. And as you can see, um, here are three pots that I wasn't using. I decided to just, uh, sow in some California poppy seeds and, um, the other two that are of the same make and model. Um, you know, I tried doing some transplants, but everything fell over the pot on the bottom left. Uh, that was the one uh, that I just uh, was digging everything out from. And I tried transplanting uh, a bunch of tufts uh, evenly spaced out to this tall pot that used to house the, the um, papaya tree. And that's looking pretty sad too, except for one seedling on the very uh, rim on the left of this pot as we're facing it. So I'm using uh, the mist mode on my garden hose uh, wand and it's just uh, it's, it's very gentle but at the same time um, if you believe the cocoa choir the, the fake soil mass is um, dry all the way to the bottom or to the middle then it's just going to take forever to water like this so um, there are pros and cons, but I don't think these seedlings can take any more of a battering than uh, what I've already provided. So this is uh, what I'm doing. And um, yeah, I really like that, uh, that uh, garden hose wand. I got it from Lowe's. 
So I started uh, using this watering pail, um, a southern patio, you know, just to get a little uh, a faster rate of watering. Um, I guess everything will get disturbed when it gets wet anyway. It's cocoa choir, so there's going to be a tendency for everything to shift around and, uh, you know, there's just no way around it. I mean, it's going to happen no matter what. And you can see the seedlings aren't doing well and there's a transplant shock, you know, there's the shock of uh, dealing with these new outside, uh, outdoors conditions. It's hot, there are pests and uh, more diseases um, being carried around by insects and snails and whatever. So yeah, it's uh, a very harsh period of adaptation for all of these and um, let's see if any of these survive. So I don't have very high hopes, but um, I wanted to at least provide a few different environments and uh, growing attempts. So this uh, first episode, the California Poppy Growing Series actually uh, covers a lot of ground. It's uh, over an hour long. So it took me a really long time to get around to making this. I know it's been probably like two and a half months or something since I uh, last had any updates. And I'd like to get some new series started. Um, I need bigger square pots. I, I think I'm going to go back to the bottom watering pots. And big pots are very expensive. And also Coco Choir is on the pricey side. But I do think it has... Uh, you know some of the best characteristics of uh, a growing medium for potted plants. Um, it's very very hard to overwater in cocoa choir, and um, it's it's lightweight, which can also be um, a big minus in that when the plants get very top heavy, like my ice cream bean, which isn't shown here but it's nearby, then you have the situation where a plant uses up so much water that it immediately uh, blows over in the wind so you have to take it to a more sheltered location or use braces and stuff to hold up a pot of this shape um, I'm talking about this um, tall pot so I bought three of these in 2022 uh, and I did transplants into all of them and then um, we have Santa Ana winds around here in Southern California so in any open space um, you have these uh, hot and dry uh, compressed desert winds uh, blowing uh, they don't start off as hot winds but they end up like uh, really hot and dry as they uh, get pulled by gravity going through the canyons coming towards the southern california coast and um, so you do have very strong winds um, and day 41 you can see there's uh, signs of predation i could tell that was uh, residual slime dried out slime left by a snail I don't know how they get so high. Um, they must be really small slugs and snails. And I don't know why they're eating the tips uh, versus just going to the center mass there and eating all the new foliage. And I'm grateful that they didn't. But as you can see here, um, there's a bunch of dead dried out husks. And um, let's see, there's a slime trail. That's what I'm trying to show you here and uh, some dried out dead leaves that are starting to blend in with um, the cocoa choir itself and yeah there's uh basically um i think we're looking at like not only a slime trail but um some stubs of uh california poppies that got eaten by snails so predation is a big problem and there's like slime trails all over here as well so if you see some foliage that at the tips looks all withered um, wouldn't be surprised if in the process of biting all my plants uh, snails uh, transmit all sorts of nasty diseases as well and you can see uh, some stuff is withering away so just imagine how bad it is on that strip of uh, dirt flanking the left side of my um, a front yard and um, it's got all those seedlings they're not in good shape uh, snails are running amok and whatever else uh, that eats uh, baby plant shoots is just like tearing everything apart it's a buffet there's a little fly there uh, I don't know what it's doing there but um, once you have uh, 
Oh, there's actually two flies. So yeah, once you have, um, oh, there's three. So yeah, that's actually pretty gross. I never noticed that until I examined this footage up close on my uh, big screen monitor. So uh, yeah, we lost one right here. Um, same story over and over again. I mean, just like seedlings getting slaughtered left and right. So uh, there's so much attrition. This is why I started with uh, hundreds and hundreds of seeds. And you can see here, you only have a stub left. So um, the seeds of California poppies are so small. Can't imagine there's much in the way of macro or micronutrients stored in there. And here's another one that's just been uh, pruned to the bone by some uh, snail, most likely. And yeah, like uh, once the first set of uh, starter leaves and whatever else is developing gets chewed away, pruned all the way to um, the base, the top of the root system, then there's no way these can come back because they just don't have any reserves. So it's not like, uh, uh, well, I don't think snails could eat like the entire shoot system of uh, a mango seedling, for instance. But anyway, um, I have footage from many of my other plant growing series updates, 2023, 2022, um, and many years prior, especially the last apartment, where it was on the ground floor, there were uh, armies of snails coming over all the time. And uh, yeah, they're shameless. They'll just uh, eat all your plants. Um, they really like uh, the various fruit tree leaves. You can see I have a kadota fig, the Joshua tree, the lemon, um, the mango, Alfonso mango, and the ice cream bean. So uh, things are looking pretty dry again, um, but it's it's kind of hard to tell like how uh, truly dry a soil mass is. Uh, you could always lift the pot to find out, um, but the weight of a uh, wet cocoa choir, it's going to be lighter than any other substrate, I think, um, save for things like, I don't know, um, just spacer things, uh, vermiculite and uh, things like that. Um, yeah, cocoa choir weighs quite a bit compressed, but yeah, once it gets uh, hydrated for the first time and gets all loose and fluffy and aerated, uh, it's one of the lightest materials around. So as I was saying, yeah, it can fall over um, very easily, especially these pots. Um, they're narrow at the base, which makes no sense uh, according to physics. And yeah, you can see the foliage has these uh, like pink um, tips sort of outline and I thought that was uh, signs of disease a uh, rot in the beginning but it's not you can see a big snail shell down there you can see that uh, seedlings been eaten to the nub it's it's finished and this one for whatever reason it's probably been predated on as well but it's uh, withering away from uh, probably disease so you can see the damage is actually considerable here um, but I think that seedling is really the only one that's making it. And I think that's a empty shell. Doesn't look occupied. Uh, yeah, so that one's definitely not going to make it. A um, bunch of these other ones aren't going to make it as well. It's just a lot of uh, carnage and attrition from various reasons. Disease, pests, um, drying out. Uh, subpar conditions and a lot of these were germinated outdoors as well but here you can see this uh, phenomenon of uh, you know weeds basically growing in concrete this is a California poppy seed that germinated it must have uh, just scattered and then I uh, washed everything off the concrete with my uh, wand and then you know, some seeds ended up here in all this organic detritus. You could see, uh, is that a pill bug, exoskeleton? It's interesting seeing all this detail up close um, that although my phone screen has way higher PPI and uh, it has good resolution, it's like you don't notice all this detail on the small screens. So um, here's on the right side, right meaning as I exit my front door, um, this side is very shaded. It's next to a fence as well. And uh, we've got some California poppies uh, germinating here next to this uh, 
uh, rose bush, which is kind of a sad sack too. It doesn't do well in that spot. So there's uh, mulch here, there's wood chips, so that helps to preserve water. Uh, you can see the what I'm talking about with the pink tips. Um, that's what it looks like healthy, but you can also see some of these have leaves that are yellowing. So they're not doing too well. Uh, these are all kind of stunted. So really the only seedling that's doing well, uh, maybe that first one I showed you in concrete um, between slabs. Look at that um, sort of cone-shaped snail shell. So we had different species of snails as well around here. And, um, you know, I'm thinking some of these growing in between rocks in, in shade, uh, maybe they can do well because their base uh, soil is it's going to stay wet and cold most of the time. And, um, yeah, these are growing in the cracks as well, but they're not doing too well. They're, they're trying. Uh, maybe the shade from that uh, grotesque dandelion species uh, is going to help. So yeah, uh, here's another one. The leaves just kind of turn odd colors, like like it's autumn, even though it's uh, late spring, I believe in this case, or just mid spring. So this is a, a new bag that I ordered from Amazon, different uh, supplier. I think it has like 10,000 seeds. The old bag was spent and I'm gonna show you what this looks like. But uh, it says, yeah, plant by June, 2024. So you've got like uh, about a year, water consistently for four to six weeks, avoiding puddles and dry spots. Um, so the home environment or um, you know garden environment, front yard environment in this case, uh, is, is very tough for these kinds of uh, plants. And you can see there, um, some of them are a little bit green, but most of them look like that, you know, uh, sort of like a tan or a brown. So that's what healthy fresh seeds look like. And I'm just scattering them around because I know, um, you know birds are gonna get some and uh, if they're interested and maybe many other animals as well. And I just want to scatter like, uh, like tons of these around, like a thousand or whatever, just to ensure that they get into all these cracks and uh, perhaps I can have a super bloom uh, unintentionally. So. Uh, the thought process here is that I've already shown you some that germinated in the cracks. Um, granted, not all of these uh, concrete slab junctions have cracks that uh, go all the way down to the soil below, which is where I think um, you know the plants can establish their, their root system. But um, I'm just trying a brute force approach. I'm not. Um, sowing these seeds in i'm not like digging and mixing whatever uh pseudo soil is uh within this uh big u-shaped stretch of uh you know fake dirt around my front yard so um yeah i, I do water and wash off all the detritus the debris um you know there's all sorts of stuff there's uh uh, leaves falling down that are generally sort of in a disease state from some of my uh, fruit trees and uh, there's uh, like bugs there's all sorts of stuff bird poop you know there's uh, like a ton of stuff that just needs to be washed off so um, the slabs all get washed pretty well in due time and um, sowing some seeds there as well to get some more action going um, I know you shouldn't crowd these things but the survival rate is so low so Germination rate is so high, but the survival rate is so low. Um, so that's the main takeaway from the first half of this video. And um, as you can see, you know, the, yeah, nothing's doing well. So except, uh, well, I suppose you could say some of these are doing, they're barely hanging on there. They're doing better than the things uh, most that are growing in the, the side strips. Uh, of my front yard and uh, in the cracks of the concrete. So um, yeah, empty shell. So regarding the ones that are growing in the cracks of the concrete slabs, um, that's sort of a very interesting niche that you I've observed with uh, many weeds uh, growing in urban environments and suburban environments. So I've always wondered about that. Uh, how can weeds and uh, wild plants uh, 
Sometimes shrubs and trees grow so well out of uh, concrete cracks because uh, my intuition tells me the concrete's going to get really hot during the day and that's essentially going to cook the plant. But I think plants are very, very resilient. Um, the shoot system can tolerate a lot of uh, uh, abuse, basically. But I think if the root system can't get established and there's not enough water and uh, or there are just there's not enough soil mass or, or other problems, then the plant's uh, doomed before you can even see it. Um, but definitely in nature, there are examples of plants that grow within uh, fissures and cracks um, and slabs of rock and boulders. So I think there's uh, definitely a lot of, uh, yeah, potential for exploring that topic to see, you know, in crappy little marginal environments, uh, little cracks between rocks and uh, slabs of concrete and sidewalks and things like can you reliably uh, farm these kinds of plants, so to speak? Um, so it's day 58. You can see there's slime trails down there in the center, although they don't really seem to be browsing on the foliage, the snails, uh, the new foliage. And you can see a bunch of new seedlings coming up here, but there's such a lag between that uh, first mover, the, the only successful survivor of that initial batch of seeds that I germinated indoors. So uh, that's a survival rate that's way less than 1%, only a fraction of a percent. So um, yeah, out of a, you know, like 300, 400, 500, maybe uh, you're just going to see one survive a, a transplant like this. And that's the one in uh, a pot by itself with uh, the tallest, uh, biggest column of cocoa choir. So at least there I can know what's going in there and control the environment. And here you can see there's a lot of germination for all the new seeds uh, from that uh, new really pretty packet that I sowed into uh, the strip on the left of my front yard, uh, exiting the front door. And um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of clumpy. They're overcrowded, but I fully expect the attrition rate to be very, very high due to constant predation from snails and uh, other pests. So, um, yeah, that's uh, the whole thing in a nutshell. Um, you know, just uh, you have to go with numbers here. That's There's a reason why they give you a 1,000 or 10,000 seeds because uh, there's perhaps a lot of native pests and predators that really like to eat these things. Um, so in the wild, of course, they're going to, every species produces uh, way more offspring than actually survive because they know the, well, it's not that they know, it's just like nothing else would be able to pass down through the generations, uh, with such a high attrition rate if they only produced, uh, you know, like one seed per plant. So, um, those are kind of stagnant and um, you have some flowers uh, that were left over by the previous tenant that I didn't pull up. Uh, you've got like wild dandelions. The uh, ones around here have uh, like multi-trunked uh, inflorescences, uh, unlike the East Coast ones. Um, when I was a little kid, I was in New York State and it's a forest environment. Everything grows really fast there. Um, and uh, trees of heaven grow like weeds there. You can see this is um, some sort of like a wild uh, pest dandelion species that grows here. So um, yeah, those East Coast dandelions, they just shoot up like uh, one flower and then they have a uh, you know, ball of seeds that blows away when you kick it. Um, these dandelions out here are quite different. So you can see a bunch of uh, seedlings germinating um, I hope those can get off to a good start in this uh, really different environment, but I don't have my hopes up because they all seem to be stunted at uh, sort of that stage of early stage of growth. All right, so it's day 62. This thing is getting big. Um, it sort of reminds me, it's reminding me a little bit of uh, the sweet annie plant that I had uh, many many years ago that I had to call sweet wormwood just because uh, there's a band with that name 
and then uh, the YouTube uh, algorithm didn't like that. So uh, back then the algorithms were a lot less sophisticated, so uh, and a lot less forgiving. So uh, yeah, I had to name that series uh, Sweet Wormwood, but yeah, it has the same kind of appearance. It's sort of like sprawled out and. Uh, the uh, foliage is just like excessively big and droopy because um, I did fertilize. I, I don't have footage of it, um, but yeah, I, I did dissolve some miracle grow. Um, actually, for that pot, I'm not sure if I did fertilize because uh, the papaya got fertilization like every now and then. But since I sort of did a postmortem and figured out that. Um, the papaya mostly died from having all the nutrients being flushed out and uh, overwatering caused by um, just excessive rains. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure that there are that there is a, an abundance of nutrients in this uh, tall pot. Uh, maybe everything got washed out. So, um, but yeah, I, now that I think about it, yeah, I, I do think I'm fairly certain that I did um, provide some Miracle Grow fertilizer. Dissolve Miracle Grow powder, all purpose plant food. So that's what I use uh, and have been using for many years uh, for my potted plants. And you can see uh, these seedlings, they're all sort of falling over, um, a very high attrition rate. And uh, well, the survival rate for this batch is uh, pretty high because they haven't been transplanted. Um, for this stage, but I'm sure as time goes on, I'm just going to lose a bunch of these and uh, getting the feeling that they're all just going to get kind of stunted and just sit there and not do any do anything because that's what the ones in the concrete cracks are doing and uh, the ones in the smaller pots. Um, so yeah, this is shaping up to be a really fussy plant. It's not um, easy to grow, I would say. Uh, in these artificial environments, you need very, very particular conditions, I'm guessing, in the wild. Um, you need a landscape that's uh, sort of like Lake Elsinore. That's the perfect place uh, in terms of aesthetics for uh, California uh, poppy super bloom. You need uh, rolling hills because the uh, hills looks better than, they look better than the flat ground of the Antelope Valley, California Poppy Preserve in Lancaster, north of LA. You need um, an environment that's like that, uh, like Lake Elsinore, that also is too meager to support many big shrubs and trees. And it just needs to be open, um, kind of not, not necessarily grassland, but um, I guess you could describe it that way, but uh, like an open weed land where nothing grows too tall. And then you need uh, abundant rain um, throughout the starting in winter, starting in late fall, actually, and going all the way to um, all the way through the winter. Then you'll get a super bloom. So this is the sole survivor of the um, batch that I germinated indoors and as you can see there's actually in a flower developing right there so this is the point at which I'm familiar with how a California poppy plant looks and uh, this is what I've seen outdoors during super blooms so yeah it's um it's uh it's really exciting you know I've got uh, more than one developing just here alone there's a, a second smaller one beneath uh, to the left. And um, yeah, I'm really eager to see what these look like. But as you can see, the other ones, um, sort of like yellow foliage at the bottom and the coloration is different. And even this plant has a bit of a yellowing, some dead leaves like hanging over the rim of the pot. So um, I must have either overwatered or uh, maybe it's just this crappy weather um, and the seasonality is wrong and I'm not using real dirt and uh, all these other uh, factors you know it's um, one moment all my plants will look healthy and the, the next moment you know it just looks like there's problems and then I have to go into salvage mode and try to 
save everything and figure out what's going uh, wrong. So on day 83, there were uh, these three juvenile cockroaches that were living underneath the tall pot. Uh, normally it's crickets. So as I lifted up the pot, they tried to go to shade, which is uh, underneath the rim of the pot. Then when I uh, shifted the pot around, um, some of them got smashed. And uh, some of those I did that on purpose to, to smash them because, uh, yeah, I don't know if those are nymphs of oriental cockroaches. I would think they are. I don't know, maybe they could also be like uh, American cockroach nymphs. I think they're oriental uh, roach nymphs. Um, I see those the most actually in Southern California. Maybe there's also that like uh, Turkmenistan roach that's kind of replacing them. Um, but anyway, nasty. And uh, normally underneath this tall pot, since there's a lot of moisture and nutrients coming out underneath, um, uh, there's crickets, but this time there weren't crickets. It's just roaches. Uh, it's really nasty. So yeah, um, some people believe that, you know, miracle Grow is poison, but, um, you know, you have all these bugs and you have this entire miniature ecosystem that uh, arises out of the fertilization of an otherwise uh, sterile cocoa choir environment. And uh, you've got like a whole host of roaches and crickets living underneath pots. Um, so yeah, it's not, not toxic. Um, so yeah, the foliage is developing well. Um, this pot looks healthier now. And um, yeah, I, I can't wait to see this first flower. It's just taking uh, many, many days. And there's also the crappy cloudy weather. It's been very, very persistent in 2023. So uh, I'm not even gonna sure, I'm not even sure I'm gonna have a good sunny day. And this isn't even a full sun day. This is like a partial sun day to uh, see the first flower in all its glory i'm worried it's going to bloom on a cloudy day and uh, you know a lot of flowers actually don't last for very long and i have no idea how long uh, california poppies stay in bloom so those are all factors to consider if there's just a week of crappy cloudy weather then uh, i won't get any good footage but as you can see, the pot looks, um, the foliage looks pretty nice as of now, whereas uh, just a few days ago, it didn't look nice. So um, conditions are uh, better than they were, I guess, uh, a few days or a few weeks ago. So uh, the rest of these seedlings that I sowed um, in the second generation, they're just, uh, this, this entire patch is thinned out. Um, something happened. So you'll see, uh, it, the conditions are different, you know. I mixed in cocoa choir along this entire strip, and I may have had uh, different ratios of cocoa choir to whatever sludge was in there um, before. There was a different kind of species of, uh, you know, garden flower that was uh, left behind by the previous tenants, um, and that was doing well. And I pulled that stuff out. It sort of had like succulent style leaves and. Uh, um, maybe that was a mistake because I don't think I'm going to get this, uh, mini super bloom that I wanted on that strip of, uh, uh, you know, fake dirt. So this thing's going nowhere. Neither of these two, um, it's sort of a double-edged sword in the ones that are germinating here because they have to compete with a, a colony of flowers that's just kind of sprawling out and taking up all the water and resources, but at the same time that said colony of flowers uh, provides shade, which is also equivalent to additional moisture. And I've been trying to water a lot twice a week. And um, yeah, these are, are going nowhere. So I think it might also just be there's not enough, uh, the cracks don't go deep enough between these concrete slabs for the roots to, or maybe it's a really thick slab. I have no idea. So, um, I have no idea how deep it needs to go. And if the soil mass underneath is all completely dry, then, uh, but I don't think that would be the case because these uh, slabs are very porous. I think water goes straight through because uh, when I uh, shower them off to get rid of all the debris, the water just seems to sink in. So it's day 86. Uh, we got May Gray in San Diego. It's been gloomy for all of 2023. So, we just have weather like this and I have to film sometimes. 
been uh, quite derelict with my uh, YouTubing duties as of late. So uh, this flower, the first one, has been uh, going on for a long time. It has a very long and tall, straight up uh, inflorescence. And we have a bunch of others. So I can't wait to see what that looks like. So all things considered, this plant, the sole survivor of hundreds and hundreds of seedlings, came out pretty well. I think the second generation that shares the pot with this, uh, those shouldn't be too far behind. Once they reach a critical mass of foliage, everything just accelerates in growth. So on day 87, I got my first California poppy flower, but unfortunately it was on a cloudy day and I don't know how much time I have. It looks a little bit wrinkled. It looks like it should be a really big flower and the wrinkles kind of worry me because I think there might be some issue with nutrition to make it turn out this way. The conditions are atypical, uh, but it's uh, really beautiful for what it's worth, um, even on a cloudy day, even though the videography isn't ideal. I can't wait to see what it looks like when it's uh, fully unfurled. So it's been a really long wait. Um, I don't know if it was like, it seemed like it was like two weeks or whatever, but uh, this is day 89. And as you can see, um, the seedlings are doing well on that little strip to the left, or so it seems. And you can see there's uh, more uh, flowers waiting to unfurl. And the rest of the foliage is looking healthy. So um, at times, you know, the foliage seems like it's not doing too well. And, but now um, it seems like it's doing really well. And I'm finally going to bring this into view. This is my first flower. So um, it's very big and uh, beautiful, although it is a little bit wrinkled. Um, I'm starting to think, are they all going to look like this? Because that would uh, definitely be some peculiarity that I would be uh, looking to fix. And um, yeah, maybe it, it just took so long to develop because it's so big. Um, I don't know what the exact conditions are that would lead to this, but it's basically got first mover advantage in this pot and I watered with miracle Grow and um, crushed vitamins. Basically a formula that I used in many of my previous plant growing series. Uh, over the years, um, it's a large scoop of miracle Grow in uh, 1.75 gallons, which comes out to be, I think, uh, let's see, how many liters is that? I don't know, like seven, less than seven. I also crush up two multivitamins to add to the mix in addition to the dissolved miracle growth all-purpose plant food to provide for lots of calcium carbonate and trace metals. And um, yeah, this is the end result. So I don't know if they're all going to look like this, but uh, I'm just really enjoying the beauty uh, while it lasts. Um, I have no idea how long these flowers can last. And uh, yeah. It, that's what it looks like uh, blowing in the wind. So it's uh, quite the majestic flower and I hope they all look like this although I think the other flower buds look smaller so um, I'm not too sure if they're all going to look like this. Uh, my guess is I'll get a bunch that are medium sized or uh, a bit smaller than this afterwards um, but that's just my intuition. So yeah it's a uh, first experience it's pretty magical. I remember uh, opening the, the blinds basically to look at this from indoors, uh, from the second floor, from the first floor, uh, depending on what I was doing throughout the day, uh, in the morning or uh, at home at night, um, if there was still any sun out. So yeah, I remember seeing many, many of these uh, flowering buds. Um, on top of inflorescences in the wild during super blooms. So I'm thinking uh, the flowers probably uh, last, I don't know, a week. Uh, that would be my guess. Um, hopefully two or three if uh, I'm lucky. But yeah, these are some stills I took. So you can see the size for scale. Uh, it's pretty big. 
and these are how the other seedlings are doing. So um, there's uh, a little bit of algae growing on the surface of this cocoa choir. So there's definitely been a lot of watering and um, it dries out pretty quickly on top. So I don't know if um, any of this ever counts as overwatering. But uh, anyway, yeah, they're not doing too well. There's uh, the usual suspects, snails and other things that are eating them. And uh, yeah, there's uh, some that are just withering away. So um, yeah, this isn't like super scientifically controlled. Um, it's just a lot of different conditions. But these three little pots all face kind of the same conditions. The spider webs as usual without spiders. So this was taken on day 90. And uh, that's what they look like when they just open up. And um, yeah, so this is, um, yeah, it's sort of like an umbrella that it has malfunctioned and can't open completely. So uh, again, I don't know if that's uh, typical. So this is uh, day 91, some more stills. Uh, the first flower is still um, the best. And the second one is a lot more compact. It has less space, uh, less in the way of gaps in between the petals. Uh, this one's beautiful too. It's got a little bit of a wrinkled appearance, so I'm just going to keep an eye out and see if they all look like that for whatever reason. or uh, Because I don't remember that in the wild, and I have uh, hundreds of pictures and video clips to compare against. But uh, the coloration is just stunning. So it's uh, one of those things where when it's your first time, you just keep looking at it through the window every day. And uh, my original hope was to have a super bloom in my front yard uh, very unseasonably in uh, the middle of summer. But um, yeah, I'm not so sure whether I can get this to do this well, get to this stage in all those other uh, little strips of uh, fake dirt on the sides of my front yard. And you can see... Um, yeah, that thing's not falling off. Uh, I'll just leave it on. So, um, yeah, I've got two flowers. Uh, very glad to have reached this moment. It's a magical moment. And I'm sure that many more are uh, on the way. You can see some foliage there on the bottom. It's a little bit yellowed. Uh, so whenever I see that, it's just a sign in uh, plant growing that there's something going on. There's either not enough nutrients because there's been too much rain and uh, I've been watering too much and washing all the nutrients out of the cocoa choir or uh, some other problem. I mean, it's really hard to interpret at times. It could be um, overwatering is a common suspect. And, um, but again, yeah, if you do overwater, you're just flushing all the nutrients out. So like, which one is it really? I, I would think it's the the overwatering in terms of flushing out all the nutrients and uh, once you do that there's just not enough um, nitrogen and other macronutrients for the plant to uh, thrive so um, yeah all the foliage doesn't stay green until the end of its life cycle then uh, there's something uh, fishy going on so in the wild you you won't see anything like that because uh, they're evolved to deal with uh, um, their native environment, which is, uh, you know, real soil, real sand, clay, and dirt out there, uh, I guess in Lake Elsinore and other places, uh, kind of, uh, the Antelope Valley, California Poppy Preserve, um, you know, a lot of the, the dirt out there is, uh, clay soil or, or heavy in clay. And you can see, um, yeah, that first flower is looking a little beat up at this point. Um, that matches what I saw in the wild with super blooms. And uh, the foliage looks pretty healthy at this point. But uh, yeah, the second flower, it, it's more compact and uh, it's not as susceptible. But um, yeah, the first flower is a few days old. So it's uh, kind of no surprise there. You know, I was hoping that would just like stay like that forever. But that never is the case, unless you have uh, something, you're dealing with like orchids. 
So this concludes my first episode of Growing California Poppies from Seeds. Please stay tuned to my YouTube channel for further updates. Thanks for watching.